Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno. A new book highlights the life of labor organizer Clinton Jenks, who helped lead a fight for equal rights for Mexican-American workers in New Mexico's mining industry during a time when the anti-communist movement was underway in our country. Jenks helped lead the International Union of Mine, Mill, and Smelter Workers in the famed Empire Zinc Strike that many may know from the film Salt of the Earth. The book we discuss today is called McCarthyism versus Clinton Jenks, and it was written by our guest Raymond Caballero, who joins us now in studio. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, Anthony, thank you very much, and thank KRWG for having me on. It's our pleasure. Welcome back to New Mexico. I'd like to kind of kick things <laughs> off talking about uh, your history. Sure. I know you have a history of as an attorney uh, practicing law. What Can you tell us a little bit about that history and what brought you into being an author? Um, I had a long run as a lawyer, enjoyed the practice, never burned out, but uh, later in my life I decided, you know, I'm going to switch gears, and um, I wrote a book a few years ago on the Mexican Revolution, Pascual Orozco. It's called the Orozco, The Life and Death of a Mexican Revolutionary, and enjoyed it a lot. And um, I've always had Clinton Jenks in the back of my mind as, as a practicing lawyer. It, it's a very, Jenks was a landmark Supreme Court case. And it's probably the most cited case in federal court in criminal cases. So I always had that in the back of my mind and uh, finally got to it. it. Took me a couple of years to research and write it and uh, enjoyed it a lot. And that's it, you know. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Jenks. Uh, can you share a little bit about his upbringing sure. uh, and, and what really brought him into organizing? In the book, you kind of mentioned parts of his his upbringing and childhood yeah. to where he, he stood up for something and, and saw injustices and made a, made a difference in some way and spoke out. Jenks is one of those rare individuals, I've only met a few in my life, who knew from the time they were little kids what they were going to do. He was born and raised in Colorado Springs, born in 1918. And uh, even as a young boy, he was an activist. He used to be, he was very interested in mines and miners, always trying to defend the downtrodden and the poor. And he got that even before he was a teenager. And um, he went to the University of Colorado, got a degree there. And, but he, what he wanted to do was uh, be with working people. So his interest in miners from early on was perfect uh, when he became a labor organizer for the mine mill and the smelter workers union uh, just after the war. He was a highly decorated navigator in the Pacific Theater during World War II and flew on B-24s. And so after the war, he got, he got into union work and that's what brought him to New Mexico in 1947. So in 47 when he came to New Mexico uh, what was really the on his mind um, being here and how did he really uh, fit in with uh, you know moving to New Mexico can you kind of share yes. where he moved to it it was a job that he was in Denver at the time working for mine uh, for a smelter in Denver and uh, got to be a shop steward and he was there not long at all when they saw it, he was pretty sharp big believer in the union movement and they offered him a job as an organizer in Grant County, the Silver City area and that's where he went. He got there around Easter time of 1947 which coincided with the beginning of what we know as the Red Scare that later on became the, the McCarthy era, uh, an oppressive era, uh, the longest era of repression that we had. It was the second Red Scare of the 20th century. What was the Red Scare like here in New Mexico, though, especially in Grant County? Well, of course, they were chasing anyone who had, first of all, let me just say, because a lot of people think it was not legal. It was absolutely legal to be a member of the Communist Party. 
the Communist Party was legal. They were used to run folks for the presidency. And so what happened was they used to ask people if they were members of the Communist Party. And there were some post-war uh, loyalty oaths and so forth. So the, at the environment after the war and then with the entrance of the Cold War, anyone who was slightly associated with the Soviets and communists were seen as being pro-Soviet, so they became highly controversial. So if you had joined, say, the Communist Party in the 30s, went to a few meetings and quit uh, and never went back to it, they would be asking you in the 40s if you were ever a member. If you said you were a member, you'd likely lose your job. If you said you lied and said you never were a member, then you would be prosecuted. So there was a no-win proposition. Can you kind of give us an understanding of really how powerful, I mean, obviously there were figures like Senator Joseph McCarthy who rose to power uh, with his committee that he formed, um, you know, going after people who were suspected uh, communists. Um, but with that in place to where you had to answer if you were a communist or not, it had to be a really powerful culture of fear going on yeah. in our country. Here's, here's what would happen. Just suppose that, you know, a member of the audience say, supposing you had joined legally during the Depression, the Communist Party, all right, and then left it, and you went about your business. You would be maybe hauled before a congressional committee, let's say, and they would ask you, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Well, let's suppose that you said, well, I have nothing to hide. Yeah, I was, I was a member of the Communist Party. This is what would happen. Then they would ask you, when you went to those meetings, who was there? And of course, you went to those meetings with family members or friends, and you would have to reveal their names, which might cause to ruin, they would lose jobs, their careers would be ruined, and so you didn't want to hurt anyone else. So rather than say that, uh, that you know, answer the question, you might take the fifth. I, you wouldn't have to answer, even though you had done nothing wrong. And then they would call you a Fifth Amendment communist. So in other words, there was no um, option that was a good option that allowed you to say, yes, I was a member, and so what? You know, it was legal, and now I'm not, and that's the end of it. So during this time, did employers use the Red Scare and the threat of communism against labor unions uh, to really get what they wanted? Well, and let, or I should say suppress any movement. This is what would happen. The Communist Party during the 30s uh, made a decision that they were going to really focus on labor organizing. The best labor organizers, the most active labor organizers were communists. Let's remember that during the 30s, the Soviet Union was not our enemy. It was the Soviet Union mostly was our ally, certainly was our ally during the war. So being a communist uh, did not have the same ring in those days as it did after the war when the Soviet Union and the Cold War started and there was very controversial to be pro-Soviet. So that the communists involved in labor unions, again, some of them were open and some of them were not. They were secret communists. Um, and but very active. So, can you tell me a little about a little bit about Jenks and his role and connection to being a communist? I mean, was he a communist? Really, the point being, Jenks could have been anything. The fact that he was a communist and was a labor organizer in Grand County, New Mexico, it didn't really affect his job. The only time that I see that it came up was at the time when the mine mill itself and maybe the local passed a resolution of some sort on should we condemn Stalin or should we do this or that. In other words, and they would pass resolutions or supporting uh, Henry Wallace in the 1936 presidential campaign, okay. Um, that they would take a position on that. But really, the day in and day out, the work that they did, had communism had very little to do with it. They were militant labor people, which meant that they were pressing their case at all times. So I'd like to hear a little bit about Jenks' role in 
you know, this infinite, infamous strike that took place yeah. at, um, you know, the zinc salt, salt mine uh, strike and his role in the Empire Zinc Salt Mine strike. Uh, what, how, how did he really play a role in leading that effort and organizing that effort? Empire Zinc was one of five locals the big one being the big, the open pit that we know it in mm -hmm. uh, Silver City area. So the Empire Zinc was a relatively small part of his membership. Jenks was the president then of the entire local, which represented all kinds of different mining companies. I've, now that's another thing I kind of find interesting was that he became president of that union. He was elected, yes. And he was somebody from the outside. Yes. Uh, from from Colorado who came to lead uh, a predominantly Mexican-American group of workers. So how did, what was, it, was it, what was it about him that made him rise to such prominent leadership? He was elected president by the membership after he'd been there less than a year. He uh, amalgamated, I mean, he coordinated, he joined, merged all these various locals, five locals, into one, Local 890. Jenks, although an Anglo and his membership was in excess of 90% Mexican, um, Jenks, from the time he was a little boy, he, he very naturally was very pro-civil rights. He and his members agreed that labor rights included civil rights. They were fighting for equality. There had been uh, discrimination against the miners going back as long as they had been there. Sometimes they would get paid uh, half of what an Anglo worker would get for the same work. And so they had tried to do away with most of the discrimination, but there were still vestiges. There were artifacts of this discrimination that, you know, that had not been addressed. The company, Empire Zinc, tried to break the union. And when they, they just refused to negotiate, which forced uh, the issue, and that's what happened. There was a strike. It was a long strike, 15 months altogether. And you can ask me, I think you're probably working up to it, to ask me why did that strike become so famous? Well, yeah, I, was, I, I think a lot of people in our area are, are, who are viewing this may be familiar uh, with it um, due to the movie, uh, yeah. Salt of the Earth. Um, what happened in this long strike is um, after all nine or ten months of being on strike, the company announced that it was reopening operations and that it would do so by using non-union labor, strike breakers, in the union lingo, scabs. Yeah. And that's what they, they announced. And what happened was that then the pickets that had been up, run by the miners, switched from becoming informational pickets to blocking the mine entrance so that the strike bakers could not enter and destroy their strike. The company went to court and got an injunction saying that the miners could not block the entrance. The night that injunction was issued, there was a big meeting at the union hall. I hadn't mentioned that the women, the wives and mothers of the miners had gotten form an auxiliary and they got to vote with the miners. So the men had a vote and the women also had a vote. So I had this big meeting, lasted hours, trying to figure out how were they going to save their strike. And finally the women said, we are going to take over the picket line. And even though most husbands voted against the women, Jenks voted with the women, a few men voted with the women, and the women prevailed they took over the picket lines. And that's what happened. They were figuring, we're not covered by the injunction. So th that's what happened. The women started, and it became violent. You know, the strike breakers and the sheriff's office and so forth, there were just back and forth, uh, these altercations, the strike line and the picket line. The women were jailed with little children, and the national press started getting a hold of it. And as a result of the, that it became so famous, Clinton Jenks later on brought this famous strike to the attention of blacklisted Hollywood filmmakers. And they got interested and said, wow, this is a story that we want to tell. And that's what started the movie 
Salt of the Earth, which is a very well-known movie. Uh, it has become a cult classic, staple in Chicano studies. And it, did you, I don't know if you saw it when you were in school. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Um, a lot of folks around here are very familiar with Salt of the Earth and the impact that film has had yeah. on not only the culture but the labor movement. But I, I kind of want to talk about um, Jenks and how he came to have the run-in or be prosecuted. Um, now, in your book, you you have uh, you you claim that the FBI and prosecutors knew that Jenks was innocent. So I, I, could you start off by telling us really what he was arrested for and why you think uh, he was innocent sure. and that they, uh, they knew he was innocent? So here's Jenks, an Anglo, fighting for, with, for and with Mexicans. So he became a hated individual in Grant County in the Anglo and in the business communities. Very controversial. When the movie came out, the anti-communist movement considered it a piece of Soviet propaganda. These are just miners on a strike, had nothing to do with the Soviet Union. But he became, nationally he became controversial. Within days after the filming ended in 1953, Jenks was indicted. I told you he had been elected president of the union. All elected union officials under the Taft-Hartley law were obligated to file an affidavit with the National Labor Relations Board every year stating that they were not a member of the Communist Party and that they were not affiliated with the Communist Party. He filed his oath, okay? The way you file it is in El Paso. Even though he lives in Silver City, that was the nearest uh, labor relations office. So that's where it was filed. When he filed that, he was indicted for falsely denying that he was a communist. It turns out now, 60 years later, I looked at all the FBI files. FBI file after FBI file shows pretty much that Clinton Jenks, all completely, there's no dispute about it, Clinton Jenks had resigned and it said here he resigned so that he could file a truthful oath. They knew from the beginning before he was ever indicted and they went in front of the Supreme Court and they said there was no evidence that he had ever resigned. And what happened back then is that there was not the Freedom of Information Act. You could, FBI files were secret. The Jenks decision became famous because it for the first time opened up Files. In other words, the witnesses who were against him, he was not able to see that they had made statements to the FBI that would have exonerated Jenks. And it, the decision in the, uh, the Supreme Court decided, they said that he was entitled to seeing those statements. That's what makes the Jenks decision so important. But yes, all those records now show that he was innocent, the government knew he was innocent, and lied. So. Could you share a little bit about his life while this fight was going on? Yeah. Uh, you know, to take his case all the way to Supreme Court, what type of, how was his life impacted? Tremendously. First of all, he was, uh, he became so controversial that in the union was trying to merge with a steel workers union and they were very anti-communist. So they were trying to get rid of all their communists and they forced Jenks to resign even though he was not a member of the Communist Party anymore. He had been, and so they were getting rid of, they got rid of their secretary treasurer, Maurice Travis, and they got rid of a number of people. So Jenks lost that job that he loved. He was then blacklisted. He couldn't get another job. He finally ended up going to the San Francisco Bay Area, and he had several jobs, and the FBI used to go by and ask the employers, well, you know, here's Jenks working for you, and he'd get fired got fired a job after job. He eventually, he went to the University of California, Berkeley, got a PhD in economics, and, but that took him years, and then ended up teaching for decades at San Diego State. He taught economics there. And, uh, but that rough period that he, from the time he was indicted uh, to the time he got his PhD was a very rough time. The FBI tried to ruin him several times, and that's documented in the book. 
Can you share a little bit about his impact with uh, the labor movement here in in our area, yes. the legacy of that, and how he really made a difference for for miners in, in our area, people who are working in the industry? Well, as the audience would undoubtedly know, the Silver City area is perhaps the most important mining area in the state of New Mexico. And it was even more important back then because there, was, there were lots of underground mines. Of course, there was a big open pit. There were, you know, really there were, it was the most active area for mining in New Mexico. The, all these mines were unionized back then. So the, the, it was the most important area for the mine mill in the state of New Mexico. And Clinton Jenks, being the head of the union here in New Mexico, per se, became a very well-known and uh, an important figure in union circles back then as a result. With this, uh, r the Red Scare movement um, here uh, that took place in our country, could you kind of give us an understanding of, uh, for people who may not have grown up as baby boomers or their kids to really how big uh, of an of a lasting I, I guess legacy it may have uh, on our area have you seen anything since then in our country that you can compare to the that type of climate well let's let's talk about that because there are some parallels today the anti-communist movement was quite anti-immigrant there was a lot of legislation so people were being deported there was a tremendous amount of discrimination against immigrants. And a lot of them who had come from the Eastern Europe, a lot of them were Jews, um, they became strong in the Communist Party. So there has a very, st the anti-communist movement had a very strong uh, anti-xenophobic uh, anti uh, uh, feeling, anti-Semitic, uh, racist, uh, and so all of those things came into play, and you see a lot of that today uh, playing out, you know, against Muslims, against Mexicans, against immigrants generally. There is a, I have not in my lifetime seen as strong a, a sentiment against immigrants as that that we find today. What do you think the union movement, the labor movement today really gained from the efforts of Clinton Jenks and it, during this time? Well, um, as I said in the book, it's probably short-lived because not long after that, you know, today there is no union in Grant County. So if you want to look at the, 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 your question in the long range, in the long range, not much of an impact, right? But it's not just Clinton Jenks, it's the union movement. Uh, today there are a lot fewer union laborers. Uh, the union movement, uh, especially because of manufacturing of going to other countries, manufacturing was the heart and soul of the union movement, and that has dropped a lot. Um, the trade unions, or that is the craft unions, plumbers, carpenters, and so forth, there's still a lot of those around, but not as many as there were before. I don't know, uh, you know, it, really the union movement grew strong in the 30s and started waning in the 70s. And so you could say that since it wasn't important before the 30s and is less important today, that maybe that period of time between the 30s and the 70s was not representative of the history. It could have been an unusual time when unions were strong. Uh, there's an effort today, to, there's always been an effort to try to, to strengthen them again, but who knows whether they'll come back. I mean, because I, I kind of bring this up because right now, as, as we're talking, there is a big strike going on in our country as we're taping this yes. episode with the United Auto Workers um, and General Motors. Around 47,000 people yes. are on strike right now. So I'm kind of wondering what are what do you think that people involved in that strike right now could really take from the efforts and work of Clinton Jenks? Well, you know, they, they have to look at a strike as to the costs and benefits. In other words, is it worth our time? The, they had been trying to raise their wages and their benefits. This is a normal for unions to do. Uh, 
they tried to negotiate. Apparently, from what I've read, the union, the company didn't start negotiating until quite late. Um, likely, they'll resolve that strike fairly quickly, but it has to, at all times, for the company and for the members of the union, it's a dangerous thing. You know, people need, they have mortgages to pay, kids to feed, and so forth. You go out on strike and you get very reduced benefits. Uh, it's scary. And so you have to, it is um, very significant. When they go out, uh, it, they're taking a tremendous risk, and the company is taking a tremendous risk too. Companies don't like to lose production. And uh, they like things to be predictable and well managed. And the strike uh, is problematic for a company as it is for its members. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us on Fronteras of Changing America and sharing so much about the history uh, involved with your book. Thank you for joining well, us. Well, thank you, Anthony, again, and KRWG. And I hope you, your audience, by the way, I'll be at Western New Mexico University to, uh, tonight, which before the program here, but I hope they get a chance to read the book, McCarthyism versus Clinton Jenks. That's the name of the book, McCarthyism versus Clinton Jenks. Raymond Caballero is the author, and we want to thank you for joining us on Fronteras and Changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno. We will see you next time on the program.